Okay, this is a continuation of section 1.5, MAC 1105. We were in the process of solving quadratic equations and we were on the method of completing the square. We had gotten through part of part A. Um, so we had gotten to the point where we had moved the constant to the opposite side that the variables are on. That's required first. Then we completed the square on the linear term by cutting the coefficient of that term in half and then squaring it to get a 9. So in order to complete this um, binomial and turn it into a what's called a perfect square trinomial, we take this number we've created through cutting in half and squaring, and we add it here. Don't forget that whatever you do to one side of an equation, you must do to the other side because an equation is a balanced um, statement. So therefore, you always have to do the same thing to both sides. So what you've done through creating this number and adding it to the binomial that existed in the original problem is you created a perfect square trinomial. And those kind of trinomials lend themselves very well to solving the equation because you're going to finish solving the equation now all we've done thus far is we've done what's called completing the square now when you're in my math lab there will actually be some problems where that's all they ask you to do just so that you solidify the two steps that exist for completing the square which is cutting in half and getting that number and then squaring it cutting in half and squaring so they'll give you two terms and just ask you what is the number that completes the square on that variable family. But we're taking it all the way, this concept of completing the square, we're taking it all the way to where we can use it to solve the actual equation. And that's why we're going further. You will have plenty of problems like this, but there will be a few where they just give you two terms and ask you what is this number after, you know, using the procedure of completing the square. Okay, so we've completed the square. We have this perfect square trinomial, which I'm going to bring up here. We also now have a new number on the right-hand side, which is a 5. And the next thing that we're going to do is factor. So when you factor, and let me move this over a little bit just so I have room. And when you factor this perfect square trinomial, yes, you could use the methods that you learned for factoring trinomials in general, which were um, at the beginning of this section when we were solving by factoring. One was called guess and check. The other one was called splitting the middle term. But an even easier way to factor this is by this shortcut. You can factor all perfect square trinomials and only perfect square trinomials by this shortcut. Okay, they always factor like this. When you do factor them, you get two identical factors. So there's a square on it, meaning that whatever I get in here would have been multiplied by itself if I would have factored by guess and check or split the middle term. And all you have to do is take the square root of the squared term. I'll call that my first square root. So that's I'm talking about that right there. Take the square root of that, and that's x. Then you're going to take the square root of the constant that belongs to the perfect square trinomial. That will be that one, not that. And square root of that would be 3. I'll call that my second square root. And then you join these two terms by the sign in front of the linear term, the coefficient of the linear term. Okay, so now you have all of this but written in factored form. Now also what you want to look at here is dropping down the equal sign, dropping down the 5, and I'm going to take this and move it up here because we're going to use what we now have. We have this in factor form and the 5 to go ahead and go and get the solutions to this problem. So let's carry this up here so we can get it out of all these little notes I'm giving you. So we just have a nice clean x minus 3 squared and on the other side we have a 5. So now what you're going to do is you're going to finish this using the square root property for solving. And that has also been presented in this section already. On the previous page there were several examples where we solved by using the square root property. And that means you just take the square root of the squared term 
you take the square root of the numeric side. Don't forget to report both the positive and negative root on the numeric side because you need to be getting two solutions for these problems because it's second degree. So on the left side, the square root removes the square, out pops the x minus 3. And on the right side, you have plus or minus the square root of 5, which leaves us with just one more step in order to finish this problem. And that would be getting the x by itself. So you're going to be adding 3 to both sides, which is what this arrow means. When you're moving the negative 3 to the other side, it presents itself as a positive 3. And that could only happen if you were adding 3 to both sides. This is just a shortened way of writing that. So the 3 is over here now, so it's not negative, it's positive, joined by plus or minus square root of 5. And those are your two solutions. And you can give the solutions in their compact form like this, or you can separate them. You could write it as 3 plus the square root of 5. That would be one answer. And then the other answer would be 3 minus the square root of 5, if you want to separate them, as my math lab often asks you to do. Okay, moving to part B. Part B is a harder problem, but involving the concept of finding a solution by completing the square. What makes it a little bit more difficult is because it has a coefficient greater than 9, and that introduces, um, you know, an extra step, and it can also introduce fractions and often does. So we're going to start this off just like we started the last problem. We're going to move that negative 4 to the opposite side, at which point it's going to become positive 4. That leaves us with our variable family, the 9x squared and the negative 6x. We're going to complete the square on this family, and we have now a positive 4 over here. Extra step that is involved when the leading coefficient, which is the 9, whenever that's bigger than 1, you're going to have this extra step. You cannot actually complete the square, which consisted of cutting this number in half and then squaring it until you have a coefficient of 1. So you have to factor out that 9. So right in here is that extra one of you know the extra steps. Factor out the 9. And at that point, when you start factoring out the 9, I would just group this entire family that we're working on in parentheses just to keep everything straight for yourself. So we took out the 9. I know they have an x in common, but we're not factoring out the GCF. We're just factoring out this leading coefficient because you can't uh, go into the steps for completing the square until you do that. So anytime you factor out anything, you want to use what you have taken out as a multiplier to get back each of these terms. That might also pose a slight challenge for you because there's going to be a fraction involved. So 9 times what is 9x squared? x squared. 9 times what is negative 6? Well, when you're trying um, to turn a 9 into a 6, that's going to in, that's going to involve a fraction. So the, you can figure out what the fraction is. We already know that positive times negative is going to give us a negative. So you, you need a negative there. And the fraction that you can multiply by 9 to get 6 is like this. Whatever you're multiplying by is the denominator. Whatever you're trying to get is the numerator. So this 9 will cancel with this, resulting in a negative 6. Don't forget to put that x there. And you can put it in the top or off to the side, doesn't matter. So we still have room to complete this square. We still have our equal sign. We still have a 4. So even before you complete the square, um, you could get rid of the 9 right now just to get it out of there. You could divide by 9 on this side as long as you do the same thing on the other side. That would leave us with, I'm going to move that up here, give us some more space. The 9 would now be gone, and we would just have, now since there's no multiplier out here now, you can drop the parentheses off at this point. So this would be x squared minus 6 ninths x. Room to complete the square. And we now have a 4 ninths on the other side. Okay, now we can jump into completing the square where we cut this in half. This lead, this, um, not the leading, but the coefficient of the linear term, excuse me. 
negative seven ninth, uh, negative six ninths, messing up there. And then when you multiply these, because that's what it means to take one half, you're multiplying this times this, this times this. So that would be negative six over 18. That reduces to negative one third. Don't forget the squaring step. You're cutting this in half, which we got negative one third, and then you're squaring it, which gives you one ninth. And that number right there is the number that completes the square. Okay, so we have found out that we had to, we had to add one ninth to complete this the square on this family here. Don't forget that whatever you do on one side, you must also do on the other side. Okay, so now we have five ninths on this side. We have this perfect square trinomial on the other side, and we have to continue. Let's, let me just remove it from all this work that I'm doing so we can get a clear shot at what we're doing. Okay, so I've combined these two numbers here on the right and this perfect square trinomial that we just created, I just wrote it over again, and then I'm going to finish the solution right over here. Okay, next step is to go into the factoring step. When you factor a perfect square trinomial, it always comes out as a binomial squared. You get this front term by taking the square root of the squared term. And you get the second term by taking the square root of the constant. Square root of this is one third. You take the square root of the top, you take the square root of the bottom. So one third would be that square root. And you join these two terms by the sign of the linear term that you were working on when you completed the square. Okay, that is equal to the five ninths that we have on the right hand side. Okay, so now because you have a, a squared term and just a constant, you could finish this problem to find the solutions by taking the square root of both sides. So now we're going to take the square root of this side and the square root of this side. Don't forget to report both the positive and the negative root or you will lose one of the solutions. So on this side, What's underneath the square root comes out because the square root got rid of the square. And then over here we have plus or minus square root of 5 ninths. Now, if you can take the square root of both the top and the bottom, then do so. But we can only, the only thing that there is a square root of is this bottom. So the 5 is going to have to stay underneath the square root while the bottom will just become a nice regular integer 3 because the square root of 9 is 3. Almost done. Now all we have to do is move this 1 third to the other side at which point it will become positive 1 third because you're adding 1 third to each side which is what the arrow means. So finally your answer will be positive 1 third plus or minus square root of 5 over 3. And again, as commented earlier, you can separate those answers if you want to, if required, and give them as 1 third plus square root of 5 over 3, or 1 third minus square root of 5 over 3. So you can give them as two separate answers, but those are your final answers. Maybe not pretty, but it is a potential option when you're solving a quadratic equation. Okay. The next thing that we're going to do, and you know, it's this is not to say that when you are given the choice of picking your own method that you're going to pick completing the square. Maybe that, that will be your least favorite method. If you're asked to do it, then of course you have to do it that way. I don't know that, you know, maybe my math lab is going to lead you through specific steps that force you to use that method. But if given the choice, it's possible you might not choose this method specifically for a problem like this. You might choose quadratic formula, which we're going to look at next. Okay, so quadratic formula, I think a lot of students like this method just because maybe their factoring skills are not as tight as they should be, even though that's really what you want to concentrate the most on in any um, algebra class you take because that is um, a major emphasis in all the math classes that follow if you're taking any that um, you know after this 
And in this class, you're going to have to demonstrate that you know how to factor anyway. So we'll do this next.